Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing today, as we like to do on Fridays. We are going to have someone from the Global Transformation Office um, talking to us um, about things organizationally transformative or uh, systems thinking. We have all kinds of topics that we do on Fridays. But today, I'm really thrilled to have with me again um, John Willis, um, who's going to talk about some uh, DevSec ops topics and his title today is the blurred and broken lines of defense and I'm gonna let John introduce himself and we will um, have a live Q&A at the end of this um, so please type your questions in the chat and we will um, have a conversation afterwards so take it away John hey thanks Diane it's good to be back um, it's been a little bit while before I've been on I love the Friday um, the Overshift Commons um, briefing is fun um, anyway uh, thank you all for um, being here or um, um, uh, one of the things, uh, for those of you who know me, I, I, I for, for probably the last five or six years, I do these sort of, I pick a theme near the end of one year, and I start thinking about, like, that's going to be, it's not the only presentation I do all year, but it, it's sort of the main, like, any, any of the keynotes and things that I might get invited to. And so uh, this is the first um, sort of attempt at this um, this presentation I'm calling the Blurred and Broken Lines of Defense. So. Um, and it, it sort of, as it turned out, um, is it, it's turning out to be a little bit of a meta piece too. So uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean by that. But uh, one of the things I would love is, you know, um, I'm Botchka Loop there's Twitter handle, uh, Jay Willis at Red Hat. I would love your feedback, right? Because this is my first version. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've submitted this to um, to Swamp Up. It looks like I've been accepted at Swamp Up for JFrog and probably DevOps Enterprise Summit. So. Um, I'd, I'd love to get any good, you know, really sort of any type of uh, feedback, the negative, positive, you could have done this, should have done that. So that would be very helpful. So, all right, um, let's get started. Um, and so for those of you, you know, so quickly, I don't waste too much time. There's a lot of information about me out there. Um, I, you know, uh, uh, I'm old as dirt. <laughs> um, so I've been doing a lot of stuff. I have like 10 startups or 11 startups and 10 or 11 books like I lost count but probably the most sort of biggest claim to fame in sort of this space is I co-authored DevOps Handbook I was co-author of a, a, a project called a, a, it's an audio book but it's called Beyond the Phoenix Pack with Gene Kim and then some I think really important working groups that I've been on and I'll talk about these two the the, the green one which is DevOps Automated Governance we're about to start a second version of that and something called the Automated Cloud Governance and I'll talk about that anyway and done a whole bunch of startups you know so and I do play guitar too. So not really well, but I do play guitar. Um, so here's the question, you know, and I, I, I said that like um, I, I, I went down, I, I had a very distinct sort of motivation for this presentation and I started building the presentation. I, I, I got sort of very sort of, you know, meta in, in, in the way I was thinking about where are we at? Like, so DevOps is, you know, give or take 10 years old. Like it's a little more than that. Um, but, um, you know, 2019 was the 10 year anniversary officially from the first DevOps Days event. Um, you could argue that DevSecOps is about five years old. Um, we've done some really good stuff, right? Like, I mean, like big time, like in both of those spaces. And, you know, again, DevSecOps is lagging a little bit behind our sort of, our, uh, all the things we've done well in DevOps. Uh, but you know what, let's face it, it's still a mess out there, right? I mean, that's the bottom line, right? Like we're still struggling. We're now calling it digital transformation and that's okay, but like just th these are sort of, like we're having a hard time. The, the complexity is growing faster than our ability to reason it. And that's a whole nother presentation. So then the question I, I was thinking about when I started writing this presentation, which is, um, and stay with me here, folks. Um, what would DevSecOps, what would the conversation of DevSecOps as a phrase or a term or a meta movement be if DevOps never existed? And, and and the reason I, 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 I'm, I'm saying that is, have we made a whole lot of choices about security with the bias of what we accomplished with DevOps? And then were those the right choices, right? Um, you know, and, and, you know, we can talk all day long, even today, most sort of hardened security people say we still are running on, you know, 20, 30 year old uh, security models, right? Um, and, and, you know, in DevSecOps, we've done some very cool stuff, right? Like we, we've sort of added the automation, but in a lot of ways, I guess, uh, you know, uh, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna pick one particular area to sort of explore, which is the, the uh, we'll talk about the lines of defense. Um, but, but I guess the question I'm adding is like, 
yes, it's additive what we've done. You know, DevSecOps reference architectures, you know, putting automation of things that were done manually outside of the pipeline. Yes, 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 all great stuff. But are we significantly making things better from a security perspective? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I was going to post like all this sort of uh, the security vulnerability and breaches that just happened within the last three days. And it looked like it was going to fill up the screen. Um, anyway, so, um, you know, and then, we, you know, we, we put into sort of agile security and we, we have those conversations. So hold that thought for a second. And then I'll say, okay, let's go back and say, um, if I say that uh, DevSecOps uh, is five years old, um, Shannon Leitz over at Intuit. Um, if you haven't followed her work, you should. She's brilliant. Um, you know, she coined it, um, you know, I think before 2015, but this was a sort of seminal uh, posting that she did, uh, you know, and she's, you know, she owns the sort of coining of the DevSecOps term because he, you know, it was actually um, just, you know, honestly, I was talking to last night. I wanted to say, like, I showed her sort of a little bit of my presentation, like, am I going to be, is this nonsense? Is this good, Shannon? You know, make sure I don't make an idiot out of myself, right? Um, and, um, you know, and I think one of the things she's great at is, you know, she sees the world, you know, way different than everybody else. And so if you go back in 2013, 14, she's an intuit. She's trying to solve these really hard problems against adversaries. And she sort of has this, you know, it sounds simple now, this epiphany of this idea of DevSecOps. Um, at that time, it wasn't, you know, because nobody else thought of it. And, and the thing that's sort of interesting about, that is, you know, that first sentence where she said everybody, everyone is responsible for security. Now it's 2015, right? And, and you know, like 2021, like we really haven't solved this one. No, I mean we have. We, we're doing a lot of things, but like I, you know, I, I do a lot of interviews and I do qualitative data analysis. Some of you might see my presentation, you know, the last one I did on this, this forum. Um, where I interview hundreds of people in organizations, certainly talk to risk, and 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 I don't get the sense that we're you know we're we're like you know we're not even in the Bs, we're like C plus maybe, um, to be honest in this. And, and I'm not saying there aren't pockets of like excellence all over the place, but uh, globally I think we're not. And then um, you know, and I think we're still trying to figure out who should do security, right? Like you know. Um, you know, one of the areas I, I, I spend a lot of time is something, you know, called, you know, sort of modern governance or sort of a new branding of or a new way to think about automated governance. And and a lot of that stems for sort of um, a very siloed approach between risk, IT sec, um, sometimes, the, you know, uh, internal audit, which may be the same, not the same, and in dev and ops and infrastructure and who, who really owns this and how, you know, and so a little bit of more memory lane, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work in Gene Kim's organization. Uh, we write forum papers, you know, it's about 40 or 50 us to get together every year. We normally go to Portland. Unfortunately, last year and this year it has to be virtual. Um, but we write these papers and there's been a number of sort of collaborative efforts over the years. The original one was 2015, um, unlikely union DevOps and audit. In 2018, it was a sort of tongue-in-cheek, dear auditors, which was an apology letter to auditors. Um, but it, it's actually more than that, right? Because if you actually like, so maybe the first three pages is this apology letter, like how we screwed up. And um, and then um, you know the next sort of 30 pages is a lot of control regs and 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 and, and trolls that were so we promised to be better at this one. Look at this and. And then, um, you know, and then uh, a project that is sort of near and dear to my heart, which is in 2019, I got a group of people together as part of that forum, Nike, Capital One, PNC, John Rezatowski, PNC, Topo Valley, Capital One, um, Courtney Kisser and, I, uh, and Nike at that time, uh, Sabre, uh, Marriott Group, Dwayne Holmes and Marriott Group, like there's some other people I'm forgetting, but, and we tried to sort of proof out, like, how could we do audit efficacy, reduce audit efficacy and toil? And, it, and that, these are all Creative Commons, so, uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit, about what we did there. And then one other, I think, historical marker for me, thinking about this whole DevSecOps, for the, for the other know me, I was the only American at the first DevOps days in Ghent, um, you know, back in uh, 2019. You know, Andrew, myself, and uh, Damon Edwards ran the first, uh, and, and actually Mark Hinkle, ran the first um, DevOps days in the U.S. together. We collaborated on that. So I've been in the DevOps game for quite a while. Uh, but, um, 
But, you know, the DevSecOps thing sort of started sort of gnawing at me in about 2014, 15, um, you know, about like, oh, my God, we forgot security. Like, how could we make that mistake? Like, um, and and uh, Tobo Powell had written this article in 2017, Capital One, about how they did pipeline design, right, creating better pipelines. And, and they, they called it, uh, it's kind of funny for you sort of geeks out there, they said the 10 gates that they – they had set up, which is uh, hex, right? So it was 16 gates, right? But um, the, um, you know, and they said that, so the, the thing that you had to read between the lines was they were saying, they were telling the organization, hey, you know, you have to, they weren't telling the organization, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, and then sort of fight that battle. They were basically saying, if you could show up with your service or application or your code or whatever, with these 16 sort of, the ability to show evidence of these 16 things, then you will get certain privileges in how you deliver your software. Like one, for example, you might not have to go to a Wednesday cab meeting, right? And and at that time, I you know I was I was hanging out with with, with Topo, and we were having a lot of discussions about like well, could we apply a blockchain model to this? And and I think we, you know, the industry found out really quick like blockchain is probably not a great model. And 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 like what was really lacking here is. What the industry was doing great is is gating a lot of things. Like you know, everybody was sort of maturing very well on the, how do we stop the build if you don't like you know, if it doesn't come from source control or if there's not a pairing on a pull request or there whatever. And then also if it doesn't have you know a, a clean build or even furthermore in the DevSecOps discussion, does it you know does it pass a vulnerability scan? Does it dast and you know uh, SAS dast and and whatever you know. Uh, software composition analysis, all those things, right? And that's a reasonably advanced model. And I would still argue it was still not changing anything fundamentally there. But um, we were doing we were good there. But like the the real another question that was creeping up is back to the audit question. Were we were we reducing any toil for internal auditors? And were we reducing any toil when it came to you know control regulations or you know GRC if you will? And uh, and and were we imp improving the efficacy of what we were actually capturing? And and so the discussion came is like if we're going to capture stuff for gates anyway, why couldn't we just be building some sort of attestation, digitally signed attestation store? I'll come back to that a little bit. And so the two projects that I, I've worked pretty heavily on um, over the last few years is you know one called the uh, DevOps Automated Governance. I talked about we're about to start the second version of that, and there's some really fantastic stuff that. That has been designed and developed since you know the first paper in 2019. A couple of sort of organizations have really taken this pretty far. We're doing some really cool stuff in Red Hat with it, so I'll show you that. And then another group I got invited to at the beginning of next year, last year, which was a bunch of uh, large uh, sort of telco, healthcare, healthco, healthcares, and uh, and fin financial organizations that wanted to do something around cloud, loosely related to the work that we did in this paper. So I chaired something called the Automated Cloud Governance. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. So, and that, that actually, we're about midway through the second working group on that. So, so really interesting stuff and I'll put it in context as we move. And you know, one of the things that as we think about the sort of the problem statement of like in today's world with all of the complexity that just grows and grows and grows, this is more a cloud focus, but this is in general, uh, this is a slide from ONUG the group that the, the second working group, um, it, it's the largest networking user group. These are guys, are people that were heavily involved in SDN definitions, uh, SD-WAN, and now uh, doing a lot of stuff in, in sort of uh, DevOps and in this case, uh, uh, cloud governance. Um, but the, the idea that like the, the complexity of what, like what we get hit with every day from sort of, you know, just in a cloud world, right, is overwhelming and at any point it's a, sort of a moving target of what your minimum viable security posture is. And so, um, you know, again, in, in this reflective mode that I was in when I was trying to put this thing together is, you know, traditional security models are in any pattern, right? That's why sort of even the, sort of the hardened sort of security people laugh at themselves. They're like, yeah, you know, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine this morning who was like a security guru you know, like 15 years ago, right? Like insane, like, you know, a kernel stuff, right? And and then um, really just gone into a lot of uh, other stuff, like, you know, sort of development and, and was pulled back into a deep security conversation. And he, he started off with apologizing that, hey, you know, I haven't really done anything in security for 15 years. And they're like, you hadn't missed anything, buddy. Um, I had a little tongue in cheek, but but again, I think the, the sort of question then is, um, 
Yeah, I mean, DevSecOps reference architectures are cool, right? Like, I mean, like, you know, automating a lot of stuff we did decoupled and manually are now sort of in pipelines, which is good. You know, sort of our SaaS stats, automated pen testing. Um, but then, you know, the, the real question is, is all this, you know, how much, how, generally says, that uses a term called securability, like that this should be an ability. And are, can we ask the question, are, are we actually more secure? And, and I think, you know, I mean, like some presentations, I try to scare everybody to death and show you all the stuff, right? Um, I'm not gonna do that this time, but like take it as default, it's pretty freaking scary, you know? Um, you know, the, the, the complexity of the problem we're trying to solve and the intelligence of the adversaries. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. All right. Um, so, so that's a given, and uh, you know, are we, you know, did DevSecOps like really fix this? Are we, I guess the, the, the sort of the main point I'm trying to make here, which is have we force fitted, remember I said earlier, what would DevSecOps look like if there was no such thing as DevOps? Would we have made all the right, the same decisions about how we are trying to deconstruct or maybe just inherent as is security models? as opposed to like what Shannon tried to do originally in 2015, which is break it, blow everything up. In fact, you know, some of the stuff that she's gonna be publishing shortly, which is adversary analysis and adversary intelligence, she's gonna blow it up again, right? Um, that's for another presentation. Um, so, so, here, so back to the sort of what is the title of this thing, the, bro the blurred and broken lines of defense. So one of the things I hear a lot from clients when I come in, at least clients that are sort of, at least clients that are sort of in this DevOps, DevSecOps, IT, ITSec, and are savvy about the sort of constraints of their control regulations and audit and internal audit. And they'll talk a lot about sort of the three lines of defense model, right? And, and, and you know, so this idea, if you've never seen this before, right, like there's like the first line are sort of the control owners. Uh, and again, like don't scream at me if like, you know, like you know, the IIA or the ISAC, and, you know, you want to repeat their version go argue with somebody else. The second line is um, is really sort of um, sort of control owners. And, and so the original three lines of defense, right, which was, um, you know, the sort of based on uh, like the, the, there was sort of, it's the financial control, the security control, the quality control, right? Like you can already see problems here if you're, if you're sort of thinking DevOps. And then you have this third line was internal audit. So, so like what's wrong with this picture? And, I, and for those of you who are screaming out and saying it's been updated, you know, the the IAA is updated. I'll get to that slide in a second. Um, but it doesn't look very DevOps. In fact, it looks very similar to that wall of, walls of confusion. Um, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, you know, um, you know, it, it, everybody sort of has their piece in this almost throw it over the wall, right? Which that's just sort of the dev, you know, space, space, space ops, pre DevOps discussion, right? Um, you know, and, and so, um, you know, and, and, and so um, I was talking to somebody else about this, you know, it's great to have smart friends, right? Uh, you know, about this whole thing about three lines defense and they, you know, sort of brought something that should have been obvious to me that wasn't, which is the whole uh, Conway's law. And I like, I started thinking like, maybe there's sort of a new, it's called the, uh, called the Taylor, Sloan, Taylor Sloan Conway law, right? Like, you know, and I won't go on Frederick's Taylor and, and, and Sloan and, you know, this command and control structure, but, you know, they, if you're familiar with the sort of um, obviously overused in presentations, but sorry, because I think it, it, the reason it probably is overused in presentations because it actually, it, it, it helps us define some of the constraints we have in modernization opportunities, right? So the Conway's uh, sort of definition is any organization that uh, design system that produces a design whose structure is a copy of the organization communication structure, right? Um, you know, there was the uh, sort of original um, so adage that if you um, if you have three groups working on a compiler, you're going to get a three pass compiler. Well, um, you know what do you get here? You know, uh, three lines of defense um, structure, right? And then, you know, like I said earlier, like the, you know, in in all honesty, like like this isn't like cavemen mentality, you know, they've like, in 2020, the IIA has updated this to be sort of more modern, but it's still a siloed approach, right? So, okay, so there's a governing body, which is awesome. It actually got rid of the um, defense to sort of promote a more proactive 
posture as opposed to everything sort of wait to like it happens and then we got to deal with it. Um, but again, like I will argue that you know they sort of collapse, you know, the, the the first line and second line and sort of this sort of quasi, you know, you could say okay, give them the benefit of the doubt that it isn't siloed there. I would argue that it still is, but you are definitely siloed from internal audit. And by the way, that's one of the biggest problems we have is the miscommunication, non dialogic um, uh, opportunities that we don't have with internal audit or risk when it comes to IT. Right. That's that's why we have thousands of control regs that nobody understands. Um, and I was, you know, I, was, I, I wanted to desk check myself. I, I won't name uh, the organization, but it's like a well-known big four, you know, consulting company who is heavily involved in sort of external uh, uh, internal audits and all that. And in their sort of late 2020, um, banking, you know, sort of uh, banking regulatory observations, you know, part of the uh, response to the final sector ISAC, basically, you know. I'll try to read this quick, but um, you know, another common issue is having uh, so your capability that's missing or in category. Basically, what they're saying, I gotta read it. You know, the for example, if the business, if this, the, in a first line of defense does not, so they're still using defense, right? Uh, even though the the IA has changed that sort of uh, nomenclature, uh, is not testing capabilities, risk, and the compliance functions. So the second line might perform testing. However, if the second line uh, does that anybody remind you of like where sort of uh, early DevOps or pre DevOps was about QA and and development, right? Like this idea, like the next one will catch it, right? Like it, it, it's just not like um, you know, and, and like this is the sort of common mindset that like that like we're trying to sort of force fit into the oh yeah three lines of defense yes yeah, fits perfectly with, and I'm not saying this is terrible stuff. I'm just saying I'm not sure that you know we're actually sort of thinking about. The sort of the, the security problem the right way. Um, we're having an honest conversation. And so I've been, you know, I've been doing this qualitative data analysis stuff for quite a few years now, where I basically interview hundreds of people in an organization. And I have this sort of presentations I've done in days gone by called the seven deadly sins of DevOps. And so I'm thinking a lot about like, you know, and, and you know, and I, you know, to me, like it, it all boils down to seven deadly sins is that you know your security, you, you have security and compliance data. Like your audits, basically, um, you know, sort of create incredible toil and have like terrible efficacy, right? Let's and and that's that's even before you get into um, you know sort of uh, containers and platforms and clusters and 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 even worse, like you know event-driven architectures and and serverless and stuff like that, right? Like. I'm saying, you, 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 like even in your sort of virtual environments that haven't been containerized or Kubernetesized or OpenShiftized, um, you're terrible at this. But you, and and the gap gets worse and worse the more you modernize, right? Um, you know, it's, you know the the ability sort of to tie some of the ephemeral activity that happens in pipelines to change records of somebody describing that complexity in human to human discussions, right? And that's what auditors are sort of going by. Notice like. You know, what's the sort of common theme of when an order truly doesn't understand they ask for screen prints? But like, that's the sort of, you guarantee no, you've not done it correctly. And so the other thing I've been thinking a lot about, so I've been in these multiple working groups, I've been exposed to sort of just a lot of brilliant people who, or, you know, like literally people who sort of run all cloud security for like 5 billion IT a year budgets, right? Like, I mean, that's a, that's like a mammoth job. And I've been fortunate enough to these working groups to have conversations with a lot of people. And I, I keep thinking about how everybody's got this sort of own agenda of what DevSecOps is. And so I don't even want to call it DevSecOps. I'm just saying it's modern governance. But there's something here. And and so um and so I was thinking about okay, what what are the things that like I'm passionate about and what are the things I think that um they cover a, a, a a lot of ground, like it's not everything. One of the hard things I, I find that if you sit down with a bunch of people and say, okay, we're gonna say, we wanna have a sort of a holistic presentation of you about DevSecOps. And I, I will tell you in every conversation that's even tried to do that, it falls apart really fast because there are so many security related things that are hard to categorize at a primitive level. And I'm not trying to do that here. I'm just saying like, um, I'm really only going to cover um, probably primarily, depending on time, the first one, um, and maybe for another date I'll talk about sort of defense and trust. But um, I'm very been very focused in risk. That's that automated governance stuff I was talking about. 
which is, you know, what are we doing to reduce, you know, to um, to reduce toil and increase efficacy when it comes to sort of our our risk controls, you know, um, usually around our uh, governance and compliance, and usually comes down to some type of automated form of attestation, sort of evidence in in some sort of digitally signed structure, and I'll go into that or a gating like the sort of Capital One model of enforcement. A second area that I like through the cloud governance project realized that all these people are highly involved in the sort of like, you know, again, overloaded terms, but they're all building data lakes, cyber data lakes, right? That's the thing. All the, all these, these data lakes are really just elk stacks, right? But, um, yeah, and I'm not, that's not saying that's a trivial thing, right? To build those things is very complicated you know, to be able to pull and sort of normalize and enrich all the data and get the right meta constructs um, into a data that actually is searchable and intelligent and can give you sort of predictive and um, and we I would categorize that of all the work that's happening under what I would call the toil and efficacy of defense. In fact, that's what most of that project is all about is all the stuff that we get from say Amazon, Google, IBM, all the major clouds are all have different type of contexts even though they might actually have the same meaning. But the poor cloud administrators like ha like have to figure out, interpret like, you know, what was a, um, a permissive grant and how is the wording of that from Amazon versus Google versus Azure versus, right? It, 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 there's a lot of toil in that. And then how do you get that into a data lake? You know, and if you've seen some of the presentations, so oh no, we'll have a, um, a spring conference and you'll get to see if you sort of pay attention just Google own and UG, you'll get to see some of these companies and the complexity that they have, they're creating on their own great data. And then the last area, just quickly, just cause I, I, you know, I think a lot about this and I do less work in, in the third category, which is about trust, right? And that's, that's all related to identity, you know? And I had a CISO tell me the other day, Liso, like again, one of the largest defense contractors in the world said that, um, John, it's all about identity, right? Like if you think about all the breaches, like it's some form of sort of, uh, you know, an account that sort of is shared or it's a server-side request forgery, like, you know, all the sort of big ones we've seen is all about identity. So then we get into like, you know, and it's not just getting in, like it's like once they're in, how do they find secrets? How do they find, you know, passwords? How do they get into systems? How do they get to the Amazon metadata server and, 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 and do a fake identity, right? So there's a lot of stuff there, right? So. Uh, again, I just wanted to get that. So, so let's talk about the automated governance, like which is sort of that first category of risk, right? And and so one of the things that um, when you think about like the whole idea of of risk, you know, or or this this way to create um, digitally signed evidence, as I described earlier, right? You take what um, what Capital One was trying to do with the enforcement. What if we could turn that into digitally signed evidence? So I like to say. Think blockchain, but like don't use blockchain for this problem. But the idea like is that instead of an auditor going ahead and sort of having to go back to a bunch of change records and emails and give me this log, give me that log, how come these two logs don't match? Well, they never will, they, 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 they're not the same, right? And give me screen prints that, what if we could just say there's basically um, a digitally signed event that's a list of a digitally signed evidence um, that's all immutable, can't be changed. In fact, the store is immutable. And um, and like, you're done. Like, okay, I mean, there's like no discussion. Like, we, we know that this is uh, truth. And, and so then the question becomes this verifiable data audit model, which is how do I prove that I'm safe? Okay, and like, we do that all day long, right? I have arguments with CIOs, right? Not since I've been a Red Hat, but when I was independent, I would go in, I'd do this analysis company and I'd go to, and I'd start pointing out that seventh deadly sin and like they would uh, say I would get really upset when I would tell them that their audits are, you know, are basically theater. I mean, it, it really, man, they, like, they defend themselves and then I give them proof about what I learned and, and, and their proof would be, well, no, 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 John, you know, we get awards and, you know, look at our sort of our, you know, and they're all these subjective like things that they say that they're safe. So the proof is this subjective manifest of change records and, and, uh, you know, and Archer databases and all this stuff, right? And, uh, but then the real question is, how, can you, like, when they ask me, I'll say, well, okay, here's a story I'm gonna tell you that I learned. Tell me how you would demonstrate that that's secure. 
even though in your subjective model, you said it was from an audit perspective. And the answer was you can't. Sorry about that. Um, and so the end of the question is how, how do you do both, right? Like that, how do you get to sort of both? Um, and um, so so then this, what we, 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 we fall upon, and in fact, this started in the first working group of the Davos Automated Governance is like, how do we move from implicit trust-based model for controls to an explicit-based proof base? It's sort of the why. And then the how is, how do we change the subjective nature, subjective evidence, or we just call them attestations, into objective attestations, right? Like how do we, instead of like having a, sort of a, a telephone game of, you know, Sue says it's gonna be like this, Bob said, did you do this, this, and this? You know, Jane says, well, it's gotta have this if it's gonna go in production. And, uh, you know, and then we spend 30 days to 40 days a year sort of reconciling these, these discussions as opposed to, we already have the automation, couldn't we just, you know, create um, digitally signed events of the things that happen with no human intervention um, and have that be the evidence. And so this idea of like sort of a, an objective evidence and closed feedback loop when it comes to security, right? So let's reduce audit times from like 30 to 40 days a year. So I've got, I, I know banks that basically just have groups that just reconcile audit issues all year long, right? Um, to like zero time, right? It's continuous, it's hit enter. Like anything that gets deployed, the evidence is there in immutable format. Um, and or and then also because it's actually coming from the automation, it's not tampered by humans. Um, it, the it, the um, you know the efficacy starts getting increased. So those the scenarios where you know the the um, you know the um, the CS is well, you know Don, I'm not going to accept that. And I said, well, let me tell you about this uh, this sort of microservice that uses DynamoDB that has this and like that and a container and it branches up to that and uses service mesh, some Istio Envoy stuff to route. Tell me where the evidence is for that. Like, <clears throat> and I'm not saying automated government solves all that, but at least you can have webhooks have the opportunity to create as much evidence as you have. And in fact, what actually gets more interesting is you move from a reactive mode where most sort of service people, developers, are in a sort of um, reactive or even conflicting mode with internal order of risk and that, oh, geez, they always want us to do this. and you know, or I, you know, the thing I always hear is like, you know, we don't tell auditors things they don't already know. Like it's a common thing I hear. And you move out of that to a proactive mode where you know, wanted to tell tell signs that things are working way better is you see an increase in self-identified risk controls. That means the not only are the sort of service delivery people on board with this new way of doing things, they're actually starting to think about how to protect the brand. And is that a latency issue? That might be a that might be a you know a brand you know brand tarnish opportunity right so all those things, um, you know shortening feedback loops you know moving away from cabs uh, enabling just you know and I, and I you know I you know I do these loose surveys but 90% of most controls and most banks are still manual today right, um, you know and so what we did is we um, structured oh there's one more thing I want to say that too I think this is interesting I I heard um, a charity may just say this and I thought it was sort of a brilliant observation and. And I, I'm using it to extend the observation. So she was saying in one, one of her sort of interviews, uh, um, she owns Honeycomb, she's found a brilliant woman. Um, she said, um, she made this thing about what's, if there's a company A, this is sort of a DevOps conversation. I'll, I'll sort of give you my DevSecOps spin in a second. If, if company A, what's the difference between company A where company A has a couple thousand developers and they're deploying, you know, on demand, sort of all the time, hundreds a day, you know, gazillions a day, I don't care. Um, and company B has a couple of thousand developers, but they deploy quarterly. You know, what's the, what is the real answer of the difference between those companies? The real, real, the real important answer is that company A order, learns, capital L learns, maybe two orders of magnitude faster than company B, right? We understand that. We like, that's everything we learn from lean. It's shift left. It's why do we do that? Like when amplify feedback loops, we want to catch it early so we can sort of fix it early. All right, and it's the whole sort of moving out of waterfall processing, right? Small batch, iterate. But think about where we are with security. We're in a waterfall, like the fact that like, and because oh, one more point is the important point is like, when we write code, sort of in the DevOps scenario between those two companies, they're all hypotheses, right? We write code, we sort of, it's a little bit art. I mean, some would say it's a lot of art and they're hypotheses. And how do we actually prove our experiment, right? It's when it's in production. And that's why sort of that shift left and amplify feedback loops and the sort of fast iterations is very important 
because we learn quick, we get to make our decisions. Um, well, you know, control regulations and our hypothesis as well, you know, you know, despite maybe what sort of some, you know, um, Sistine Chapel like, you know, building in your sort of financial institution thinks, you know, with the vaults of the papers and the, the regulation stacks of books. I mean, they're hypothesis, right? And, and so the question is, if you're doing uh, audits once a year, you have all the ills of what you what we had pre DevOps, which is by the time you actually try to reconcile that, everybody's forgotten about it. We've been on like four more projects since then, right? So, so then the question is, are we getting immediate feedback loops on our control? And I would argue that this type of automated governance structure is an ability to uh, increase efficacy uh, through that process. So, sort of quote unquote terribly phased DevOpsing security. And so this is a structure, it's in that uh, Creative Commons books that you're sort of welcome to get um, on IT Revolution, you can download it. Uh, as the first reference group that I talked about, we tried to figure out what, what are the stages and what were sort of the common attestations. It's a really good book for just understanding, you know, con you know control actors and, and common gating or attestation manifestations. And, uh, and again, I won't go through all these. And actually this has been updated to sort of, this is not, this is, there's some of this in the book, in the original reference paper, but you know it's it's sort of in my travels and work that I've done internally and externally. Like you can see in the development stage, you might have code quality from Sonar Cube or Customs or or change size or cyclometric complexity. Was there a pairing on a pull request? Branching uh, an optimum branching strategy, clean dependencies, um, build performance, build version, linting, SAST in the build stage. And you can look at and these are just examples of certain places that. We've done a couple of internal hackathons, so we use you know some of the easy kill products like Sonicube and um, you know and then artifact versioning. So it would say maybe come from Nexus, Meta Package, code signing. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a kind of funny story in a little bit about code signing, um, container scan, and then prepod, and and then one of the things that we did after that original um, paper is a couple of the organizations. Um, we're going to really address this heavily in the second. Um, you know, originally we were calling policy code, but that, that is such an overloaded term. Like, you know, for our purpose, it's really more like a risk as control. And I don't know that we're going to stick with that as the name of the DSL, but this is very specific to the automated governance model I just described. In other words, the, there would be a collaboration between risk or internal audit and developers. It's like sort of cut out the infrastructure people, like cut out the, it's like office space. Like, what do you do here? In other words, let's just have like a design and requirements. Let's have sort of, you know, risk or internal audit, sit in and collaboratively create an artifact that is an agreed communication structure. Because the other problem you have is, you know, unless you're sort of constructing something that the automation is going to use, you're going to have like mismatches in terminology and thinking and context. Whereas this forces you to sort of spell out the enforcement and attestations that need to have. And you, you, you know, just the YAML itself creates a sort of a meta agreement. Internally in Red Hat, uh, we've been, when I got to Red Hat, you know, I've been working externally and then I got to find out there was like some really awesome projects of you imagine as a large open source company that we have. And something that um, is, is called the Trusted Software Supply Chain that was originally done as uh, some of the uh, government um, uh, software factory models that they were trying to sort of drive or, or red sword they call. And uh, this is really cool. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a little tight on time. So like, there are lots of really cool presentations here, but this is just sort of foundational. This is an automated governance by itself, but it is, uh, you know, it's just my whole thinking. I, I really like this one because it's um, it's an in opinionated re um, reference, but not an opinionated uh, implementation. In other words, it's a it's a composable sort of YAML based structure to define whatever uh, with with sort of opinionated structure in terms of the stages. But completely unopinionated on the choices. Like, do you want Jenkins? Do you want Bamboo? Do whatever. It, like, it doesn't care. Um, and 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 it does a lot of cool things. Like, like not only will it sort of you know sort of inject um, like Sonic Cube to run a scan, it will actually take the artifact and scan and store it. Those are all necessary things you need for automated governance. Because what you'd like to do in the attestation is not only say this happened, but possibly ta and then sha that that lock right as immutable event in the in the chain so it's, it's this is brilliant um you know and and so the the model then like takes that work with some of the open source work that i've been on and this sort of model that that does collecting and testing and enforcing 
uses um, a DSL, something like a YAML-based structure. Originally, we were using Graphius. I'll talk about that. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be with Kubernetes or OpenShift, but like in our examples, we're using OPA and Rego. Um, and then uh, this is the TSSC project. It's actually being renamed um, to um, to this um, uh, uh, you know TSC Python project. And uh, and the other thing, again, this is like what's really cool about working with Red Hat. There's another team that was building basically. Um, you know, uh, what it's called a verifiable audit data store, which basically based on some of Google's work with something called Trillion, which again, I'm going really fast, but you can look it up, is um, basically a true immutable storage structure. In other words, like, um, like the, it just can't be changed, right? Like, so now, like, instead of putting our attestations in, in this open source Graphius tool, which, you know, has worked very well the last couple of years for us, but now we're trying to look, because this is based on a Merkle tree, and it's just it's just like the perfect solution um, for um, you know, and some of this stuff comes out of what, what uh, Google's doing. I, it actually, a lot of it came from uh, certificate transparency and and key transparency. But like you can also use it for this um, idea of um, verifiable audit data structure. Like it, it's just really you put all this together, and it's really cool. So here's the sort of obligatory. Like we're going to talk about security. Got to mention solar winds. But I, I have a real sort of uh, point here. So, um, you know, I, I, I um, had the opportunity to um, do some research about the solar panels thing, and I won't sort of talk about why I had to do that, but you let your imagination be your guide. Um, and, and I, you know, I went out a lot of places, and, like, KPMG had some good stuff, and, uh, you know, Krebs on software is always good. In fact, he's the one that pointed me to this, uh, the CrowdStrike. And they, to me, they did a fantastic job of how – the original kill chain happened inside of SolarWinds. This is like before it gets out to the wildness, everybody. And it, it's an ingenious, I mean, it like the, to Shannon's, Shannon Lee's point, man, the, the adversary analysis is overdue because these people are ruthlessly intuitive and, and, and creative. Um, and so I won't go through the whole thing, but like one of the things in the blog article, which is brilliant, is they used, if you're familiar with the MITRE, um, you know, the MITRE attack framework, um, like which is we're using heavily in our cloud automated governance project. Um, so I, 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 you know, so so I, I will say, you know, this is my sort of matrix, but I took directly some of their matrix and sort of merged it with with. So here's the point. What I wanted to show is how automated governance might have been very helpful and instrumental for SolarWinds uh, based on the uh, attack surface here. So. Um, we'll go through a couple of these, but like it's the, the two meta points, and these slides will be variable, so you can have fun sort of finding the original article and see how I said, you know, this attestation would have been like incredibly helpful for them. But one of the things that um, the CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike sorry, pointed out, which was there were all sorts of hash mismatches. So it just, in short, they hijacked MS Build. They basically uh, went ahead and, you know, sort of inserted their own code into the build. They did some log masquerading. I mean, it's just crazy intelligent stuff, right? And they were doing it for many years, too. So they had a lot of time to perfect their system. Um, and, and all I was saying is that it had they had a really sort of mature pipeline structure, which, you know, we don't know, but have seen they didn't have proper hygiene. And um, But even furthermore, if they had automated governance, they could have had, you know, there could have been like signing mismatch, code signing mismatches, um, if they were to use something like Trillion as the attestation, so like you couldn't, it's a Merkle tree, so you cannot mutate it. Like, so some of the mutations that they did for log masquerading. Um, so, um, you know, so I, I tried to sort of put in like their sort of observation and, you know, in their tactic and ID from a MITRE perspective. So I, I thought this was fun. And, you know, and I think it, it to me, you know, again, I'm taking advantage of the situation, you know, solo wins, hey, oh, pay attention, everybody. But but I, I really wanted to make the point that that you know had they had automated governance now automated governance doesn't solve everything like like I'm not even going close to that but it's a level of hygiene that can produce sort of a bill of material or something that that you don't like this idea that that like when I go in and you know Shannon was saying this to me too like when you go in you talk to people and say what's your evidence that you're actually doing this correctly and and like it, and if you can't even show me some form of a bill of material for everything that you create from a software factory perspective, then you're not, you're wrong. 
um yeah that's i think that's it so um i covered everything i wanted to cover and uh so you covered more than everything you wanted to cover there there's yeah. <laughs> there's enough tips and tricks here and leads to other topics that we could probably go on for uh, a month of fridays um so uh thank you very much for this i think this is it's uh, what, what i'm going to have fun with is getting all of the um additional resource links for this yeah, cobbled, yeah, yeah, yeah. cobbled together i think um so thank you very much for coming john um you know, there were a couple of questions I think I handled mostly about, you know, how do I get a certification in DevSecOps um, uh, from out of Red Hat? And, you know, it, it, that's an interesting question in that, you know, how would you certify someone in this topic? There's there's so much to it. You know, I have dear friends, dear friends that I really like that actually do this, right? And so I, I try to be sort of like split the middle, but I, you, you can't, you can't certify. I mean, again, um, if, if the if the goal is to sort of you've got an uninformed organization that requires it and and you're going to play their silly game because it helps you achieve the things that you I don't know why this keeps happening but I thought I'd turn this off but um, sorry about that um, it, you know then then yeah then like God bless you just do it right but 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 the truth of the matter is like I said earlier when I I try to sit down with really intelligent people and say like what is the holistic landscape of their psychops? Well, is it identity? Is it authorization? Is it you know? And even in the identity space, is it secrets management? Is it um, is it certificates? Is it um, you know? Is it encryption? Is it encryption at rest? Is it um, you know? Does it include discussions about vault? Does it include discussions about um, spiffy and the service mesh? I mean, like like right? And and then okay, so let's take another topic: audit. Okay, you know, like. Forget it. We could spend you know months on audit. Like, do you got to know Archer? I would say no. That, you know, like that's a sort of old way of thinking. Do you have to know three lines of defense? Um, if we talk about automate, if we talk about cloud governance, you know, then oh my God, like, you know, then like, um, you know, like what are all the sort of things in 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 in, in Sims or or SOARS or you know, how do you create cyber data lakes? And then you know, what role does sort of the traditional Sims and SOARS give you versus now all the stuff you get from sort of Amazon's web services that are all very immature from that perspective. And then even if you got that right, I mean, like, again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm over rotating on this, but I want to just make the point why certification is in general nonsense. Because even if I got all that right about Amazon, what if you're going to use Google and, and Microsoft? Yeah. Because that's all another. So, I mean, when we just use the banner, I mean, in DevOps, I will give you a little bit of wiggle room on a certification. Because I would say, okay, if you understood the meta, if a certification test, I still sort of fundamentally disagree with these certifications, but if you understood the sort of meta around certain principles that I think were very important to have in DevOps, you know, sort of the culture, the automation, those things, you know, I mean, Damon coined something called CAMS years ago, cultural management. Like if you understand those things as, as primitives of behavior and how you, how the technology and the, and the social, social tech, social technical aspects of it. Like, I think you can answer those questions to do a pass fail. Maybe. But, but I think when you get into security, you're like evidence that even the security people make fun of their, their, I just don't see how you, um, I mean, look at the training you have to just go from SANS Institute just to learn traditional security. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, so, I got to say, don't get me started, but I've already started. started. I, I know. I, know. I, I love getting you started. That's like, I love, you know, working you up on this. But I think the, the, the short answer is like Red Hat certification is specific to products um, right. for the exactly. most part. There's some, you know, and so like there is a, uh, you know, uh, certification as a specialist in security for containers and OpenShift contain on the Open and the OpenShift container platform, where you learn all the security bits of that platform of that technology. But it's not the cultural thing. It's not yeah. the uh, you know automating all of um, you know the the security and governance and the audit and the risk yeah. and all, you know. It, and that's a great point, Diane. Right? Because I mean, as much as I rant, but you're absolutely right. Not because I work for Red Hat, but you're right. I mean, if if the question is like we you know we, we acquired Stack Rocks, right? And then yeah. like like if, you know, will we or you know we will have a certification about the sort of how to use that tool effectively and even some sort of meta aspects of using it. 
that's a valid certification, mm -hmm. right? Or, or any other sort of specific tool that we have, like container, you know, our version of sort of container adoption and stuff like that. I agree. But I think I sort of drives me nuts on Facebook when somebody posts there, like, I am DevSecOps certified. You know, <laughs> like, like yeah. God, like these graduates say, like, tell me what you know. And now oh, yeah. you figured all this out because I've been struggling for at least on the security question for like five or six years to try to figure out what this and and it was this presentation that finally got me to at least create those three boilerplates that I talked about. Like mm -hmm. and that's taken like five years for me to get to even build that slide to say in my mind it's it's risk, defense and trust. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, like if you go back to your you know you don't you don't have to do this, but if you go back to your like your software factory uh, slide, you know, there are pieces of technology in that that people should get certified on, right. yeah, you know, totally. and should know in depth. Um, but it's it, and then this is kind of why I have you on on Fridays when we're talking about organizational and transformational and systems thinking and and, and higher meta things. Um, that these things are um, a level above the traditional sort of things that you can get certified on. Um, and but that, that's GTO too, right? We didn't spend a whole lot of time. I know our team is you know on this um, this forum quite often, right? But like we're sort of about like we didn't get hired because we were like Red Hat experts or we knew Senko, yeah. so we knew you know like we got hired because we you know our all four of us you know uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer, if you don't know Kevin Bear is co-author of the Phoenix Project and Jay Bloom is probably one of the smartest guys you know one of the top three smartest people I've ever met um, the um, you know, like we're all, you know, we try to bridge that technical and social, right? We try to, yeah. you know, make sure that we're not over rotating on meta, but we're also like, you know, so we're trying to hit the middle ground. And that's, that's what we do here at Red Hat, you know, and that, that's our sort of bullhorn too, so. And that's why it's wonderful having you here and having you back this week. I, I think that's a great way to, to wrap this up too. I think um, that's what you bring and that's what, you know, organizations, have to also wrestle with that um, this is both a techno technology issue and problems and things that we can solve with some training and some certifications, but it's also a meta problem and a cultural problem um, or initiative within companies that um, we're, we're thrilled to have you guys here um, helping us um, work with all of our customers and ourselves um, internally too, to wrestle with these things and help um, drive them forward. So thanks again for coming here today and um, we'll make this, uh, this, this uh, session available up on YouTube and um, tell us again, John, what was the, the um, conference that you're gonna be giving this presentation again? Oh, so I am confirmed for Swamp Up. I think that's in May, that's Jay Frog. So they're, they're great people. I just, I've been speaking at their conferences for Quite a few years now. They're just, they've got this great community. This, their CEO is just a lovable guy. Um, and I just, I like that environment. And uh, so I just have a blast. And so I've, I speak there almost every year. So I'll be giving this presentation at their swamp up. And I, I don't know if I'm confirmed yet for the DevOps Enterprise Summit, but it'll be the first time in, in since its existence that I wouldn't be speaking if it isn't accepted. But that, that'll be uh, basically what we call the virtual London. Mm -hmm. And then I think it will be April, May, and then there'll be, I'll probably repeat that at the end of the year for the virtual Vegas. Hopefully, it's, maybe it's not a virtual by the time I get to Vegas. Yeah. So, I don't so, know, it probably will be, but. So I'll work with you, John, to get some of the, you know, make sure I get the right um, references in for this. And if anyone out there is watching this after the fact and has feedback um, for John, reach out to him. Here's his contact information and um, join him for further conversations on this topic. And yeah, I'd love any, like I said, it's the first time I've given it, like, so that, did I over rotate on something? Did you, I would love any sort of really hard constructive feedback it would be very helpful for me. So. All right. And thank well, you, Diane. Thank you for you doing what you do. Like, it, it's right. great to have this forum to, 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 to come and experiment and, you know, just be part of the community. So. I love giving away the podium. So if any of you are out there and listening to this and have a, another take on it or a deeper dive that you want to do, just reach out and um, I'll definitely give away the podium. So thanks again.